Hello, my name is Paul, and in this video, we're going to walk through the fundamentals of Swift programming in under one hour. It's going to be super fast, like lightning. If you want to, pause the video frequently as you go to follow along, or maybe to sit back and watch me talk. This video is really aimed at two kinds of people. The first kind are people who have finished the introductory days in my 100 days of Swift UI course. If that's you, this will be a review of everything you've learned so far. So to sit back and have a refresher as we go. The second type of person are folks who already have lots of experience in other programming languages and they want to get their skills across to Swift easily. If ideas like arrays, dictionaries, functions, closures, protocols, and more are comfortable for you already, this is the right video for you. Otherwise, perhaps check out my existing 100 days of Swift UI course. The introductory days there I mentioned already, they go for the same stuff, much slower, lots more detail, many more examples to really explain what this stuff does. This is the fast version as a refresher only. If you're all set, let's get to it. But trust me, strap in your ears, this is gonna be fast. Let's start at the beginning. Swift can make constants and variables, but constants are preferred. For example, I can make a new variable and change its value like this. Var name equals Ted, name equals Rebecca. If you don't want to change a value, use let rather than var to make a constant. For example, let user equals Daphne. And when you want to know what's inside a variable or constant, use the print function, passing in a value. For example, user. And that'll print out Daphne into the Xcode area below. Swift strings start and end with double quotes, like this. Let actor equals Tom Cruise. Plus, they work with a full range of world languages with no problems, including things like emoji. Just go ahead and add them straight to your string. If you want to have double quotes inside your string, place a backslash before them, like this. Let quote equals, he tapped a sign saying, backslash quote, believe backslash quote, and walked away. And what we're saying here is, these quotes don't actually end the string, they're just inside the string. If you want a string that spans multiple lines, you start and end with three double quotes, like this. That movie equals, quote, 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 a day in the life of an Apple engineer, quote, quote, quote. No matter how you make your string, Swift provides an collection of properties and methods that make them useful to work with. For example, I could say print actor dot count to read how many letters are in the actor string. There are also methods like has prefix and has suffix that determine whether a string starts or ends with a substring. For example, I could say print quote dot has prefix he, which would be true, it starts with the letters he. Whereas print quote dot has suffix away dot That'll be false because in Swift, strings are case sensitive and it starts with a capital A, but has a lowercase a in the original string. Swift stores whole numbers using the type int and they support the standard range of mathematical operators. For example, let score equals 10. Let higher score equals score plus 10. Let halved score is score divided by two. It also supports compound assignment to modify a variable in place. For example, var counter equals 10, counter plus equals to 5. Now, integers come with their own functionality. For example, you could say, uh, let number equals 120, print number dot is multiple of 3. And of course, the answer is true. 3 times 40 is 120. You can also make new integers in a random range of your choosing. For example, let id equals int dot random in the range of one through a thousand. So it could be one, it could be a thousand, or any number in between. If you create a number with a decimal point, Swift will consider it to be a double, even if the numbers after the point are zero. For example, let score equals 3.1 a double, but 3.0 is also a double. And this matters because int and double are different data types in Swift. You cannot mix them by accident. 
Swift has a type bool to store either true or false, like this. Let good dogs equals true. Let game over equals false. You can flip a boolean from true to false or vice versa by saying toggle. I could do var is saved equals false and then is saved dot toggle. You can create strings out of other data by using string interpolation. Inside your string, write a backslash, then put your variable or constant name inside parentheses. For example, I could say let name equals Taylor, let age equals 26, and now let message equals I'm string interpolation name, and I'm string interpolation age years old, and then print message. And when this code runs, it'll print out I'm Taylor and I'm 26 years old. You can group items into an array like this. Var colors is an array of red, green, and blue. Or let numbers is an array of 4, 8, 15, and 16. Or var readings is an array of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.8. Now each of these things are different arrays. It's an array of strings here, an array of integers here, and an array of doubles here. And this matters because when you read a value, you'll get a string, int, or a double, depending on the array you read. So if I have print colors zero, that'll be a string. Or print readings two, that will be a double. Now be careful when you specify an index like zero or two, make sure it exists, otherwise your code will crash. If your array is variable like colors is, you can say append a new value. I'll add tartan. However, the value you add must match the type of the other items in the array. So I'm adding a string here. I couldn't add an integer here. Arrays have a bunch of useful functionality. You can use count to read how many items there are or remove at to remove a single item. I could say colors.remove at zero to remove red and then print colors.count. So I should still have three items in there. Plus you can check whether the array contains an item by using contains. I'll do print colors.contains octarine, which ought to be false. Dictionaries store multiple values using keys we specify. For example, we could make a new dictionary called employee. And in here I'll say the key name is name, Taylor, key name job, value singer. And when you want to read values back out from the dictionary, use the same key names you use when making the dictionary. For example, I could say print, uh, give me the employee's job. If job doesn't exist, give me a default value of unknown. In this case, job does exist, so this will print singer. Sets are similar to arrays, except they can't add duplicate items and they don't store things in a particular order. For example, I can make a new set of numbers by doing a new set with the array of one, one, three, five, seven, nine. And when I print out numbers, what we get is basically random. So we're gonna get here, one, seven, nine, three, five. The duplicate's gone and the order's gone too. If you want to add items to your set, use insert. I insert the number 10 here. We don't append because there is no order to append to. Now sets have one massive advantage over arrays. When you say something like numbers contains uh, 11, it will run instantly, no matter how many items a set has. Even if it has 10 million items, it'll still run basically instantly. An enum is a set of named values we can use that makes our code safer and more efficient. For example, I can make a new enum called weekday and give this one case for every weekday in the week. We'll do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I can now make a new instance of that enum by saying var day equals weekday dot Monday, and assign it by doing day equals dot Friday. You can try to force a specific type on a variable or constant using type annotation. For example, I could say var score double equals zero. Now without the colon double part, Swift would imagine this was an integer, but we're saying no, this is actually a double. 
Let's look at some existing type annotations, the types you've seen so far. We could say let player string equals Roy, or let lucky number int equals 13, or let pi double equals 3.141, or var is enabled bool equals true, or var albums be an array of strings, and I'll do this equal to red and fearless. Or var user is a dictionary with string for the keys and string for the values equal to id colon at two straws. We'll have a set as well. We'll do var books is a set of strings equal to a set the bluest eye and foundation. Now arrays and dictionaries, these two here are so common. They have special syntax that's easier to write. We can actually just say brackets around string and here with dictionary it's string colon string like that. It's just shorter, otherwise it means the same thing. Now knowing the exact types of data like this is particularly important when you want to make empty collections. For example, we could make an empty array like this. Var teams, an array of string equals a new array of strings. Or remove type annotation entirely and say var clues equals a new array of string, like that. Values of enums have the same type as the enum. So if I had enum UI style, case light, dark, and system, I could say var style is a UI style equal to dot light. Use if, else if, and else to check a variety of conditions and run code as appropriate. For example, I could say let age equals 16, if age is less than 12, print you can't vote. Else, if age is less than 18, I'll do print you can vote soon. Else, all other values, print you can vote now. Now we can use ampersand ampersand to combine conditions together. Both must be true in order for the whole thing to be true. I could say let temp equals 26. If temp is greater than 20, and temp is less than 30, print it's a nice day. Alternatively, if you use pipe pipe, you get or, when if either one of those two things is true, the condition is true. Swift can check a value against multiple conditions using switch. For example, I could say switch on forecast. If the case is dot sun, print it's a nice day. If the case is dot rain, print uh, pack an umbrella. For all other values, default, I'll print should be okay. Now switch statements must be exhaustive in Swift. You must have one case for each value on your enum, or have a default case to handle any other kind of value, which is important for things like strings, integers, and more. The ternary conditional operator checks the condition and returns either one item or the other, depending on the result of that condition. For example, I could say, let age equals 18. Let can vote be, if age is greater or equal to 18, send back yes, otherwise send back no. And when this code runs, can vote will be set to yes, because age is at least 18. Swift's for loop runs some code once for every item in an array, set, or dictionary, or across a fixed range of numbers. For example, I could say, let platforms is an array of iOS, macOS, tvOS, and watchOS. And then say, for OS in platforms, print Swift works on OS, like that. You can also loop over a range of numbers, so in like for i in one through 12, print 5xi is 5 star i, to get the 5 times table printed out. That thing there, 1 dot 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 12, means from 1 to 12, inclusive of 1 and 12. If you wanted to count to 11, you could do 1 dot dot less than, up to but excluding the final number. And if you want to exclude the loop variable entirely, just ignore it, use underscore instead. For example, I could say var lyric equals haters gonna, 
And then for underscore in one through five, lyric plus equals to hate. And now print lyric to get a nice Taylor Swift shake off lyric right here in Swift. There we go. There are also while loops. Give these things a condition and they'll run their loop body for as long as the condition is true. For example, we could say var count is 10, while count is greater than zero, print count dot dot dot, and then count minus equals one, and then when the loop finishes, print go. That'll count down from 10 to one, then print go. You can, if you want to, use continue to skip a particular iteration of a loop and go to the next iteration. For example, I could say, uh, let files equals an array of me.jpg, and then work.txt, and then sophie.jpg. And now for file in files, if file has suffix .jpg is false, so it's not a JPEG, continue, go to the next file. If we're still here, we'll print out found picture file. Alternatively, you can use break to skip the remaining iteration and all future iterations as well. It'll exit the loop immediately. To make a new function, write func, then your function name, then parameters in parentheses. For example, I could say func print times table for number int, then for i in one through 12, print, uh, let's do i x number, is i star number. And now I can say print times table number eight. Let's get the eight times table. Now notice how I've got to say number colon eight at the call site. The parameter is part of the function call itself. When you want to return data from a function, tell Swift what type it is. Then you'd return to send data back. For example, we could make a function to do a dice roll. Func roll dice returns int and then do return int.random in the range one through six. And now let result equals roll dice, and then print result. Now here, as our function contains only a single line of code, it returns our value, you can actually remove the return keyword entirely and just have int.random in. Tuples store a fixed number of items of specific types, which is really convenient for returning multiple values from a function. For example, I could say func get user returns a tuple with first name being a string and last name being a string. Then inside there, I'll send back first name is Taylor and last name is Swift. When I call it, I can say let user equals get user and now print out name is user.firstname and user.lastname. I can read those tuple values directly. Now, if you don't need all the values from a tuple, you can destructure it. You can pull it apart into individual variables or constants, and then optionally ignore the ones you don't want using underscore. For example, I could have said, let firstname underscore be get user, and now I don't get access to the last name, and first name is a constant all by itself. If you don't want to pass a parameter's name into a function, put an underscore before it. For example, func is uppercase, underscore string string returns bool. And we'll say string is equal to string dot uppercase. I'll make a new string like uh, hello world, and set result to be is uppercase string. So there's no parameter name at the call site anymore. An alternative is to write a second name before the name. One for external use, one for internal use. For example, I could say func print times table for number int. This will do for i in one through 12, print i x uh, number, is i star number. Now at the core site, I say print times table four, five. So four is used externally and number is used internally. Four comes first, number comes second. We can provide default values for parameters by writing an equals after their type name, then given the value. 
For example, I can have a function called greet, some kind of person string. And will it be a formal greeting or not? A Boolean equal to false by default. So I'll say if it's formal, print welcome person. Otherwise, we'll just do print hi person. And now when we call greet, we can call it with formal or without. If I want to greet uh, Tim formally, I can do, or I could just greet Taylor and formal will be false by default because that's what we've asked for. To handle errors and functions, you've got to first define the kinds of errors that can occur. Second, write a function that throws one or more of those errors. And third, call that function and handle its errors appropriately. First, we'll make a new enum to store password errors. It conforms to Swift's built-in error type. This has two password errors, it's too short or it's too obvious. Now I'll write a new function called check password that accepts a password string. I'll say it's able to throw errors and we'll return a string. If the password count is less than five, it's not good enough, we'll throw password error dot short. If the password is equal to one, two, three, four, five, then we'll throw password error dot obvious. If we're still here, then let's check the password. If the count is less than 10, we'll return okay. Else or other lengths will return good. Now we want to call the throwing function. We'll say do let result, scroll down, equals try check password one, two, three, four, five, and print out the rating is result. And now catch errors. If something goes wrong, this line will not be run. It'll jump to one of our catch blocks instead. I'll catch the error, password error dot obvious, and print out, uh, I have the same combination on my luggage. Then a generic catch all at the end, print, there was an error. Boom, let's press play, and it'll print out, I have it on my luggage. Now when it comes to catching errors, you must always have a generic catch all at the end, like this one, that'll catch, catch any kind of error at all. You can assign functionality directly to a constant or variable like this. Let's say hello equals open brace, print hi there. And now you can call say hello like a regular function, just by saying say hello, open and close parens. And it'll print out hi there. Now in this code, say hello is a closure. It's a chunk of code we can pass around and call whenever we want to. If you wanted to accept parameters, place them inside the brace. For example, name string returns string in. And now I can say return hi name, like that. Now here, the in keyword marks the end of the segment with our parameters and return type. Everything after in is a body of our closure itself, the actual function code we want to run. Now closures are used extensively in Swift. For example, there's an array method called filter, which runs all the elements of an array through a test we provide as a function. And all the ones that pass the test go into a new array that's sent back for us to use. We can provide this test using a closure. For example, you have an array of names and filter out all the ones that don't begin with T. Let's say, let team equals an array of Gloria, Suzanne, Tiffany, and Tasha. And then we'll say, let only T, all the T names be team.filter, and I'll pass in uh, name string returns bool in. This is our closure. Return name dot has prefix t and print out only t and that'll print out just tiffany and tasha the only two names that begin with t so inside the closure we list the parameter we receive from uh, filter and name strings coming in and say what's going back a boolean true or false then write in 
and everything after in is the main body of our closure itself. Swift has a few tricks up its sleeve to make closures easier to read. For example, this closure has only one line of code and so we can remove the return keyword. Second up, we know that filter must receive one item from the array, in our case, a name string. It'll pass it through a test and would always return a Boolean, true if it passed a test, false otherwise. It must work that way. It must take one item from the array, one string, and return true or false. Swift knows that, and so we can remove the return type entirely. In fact, we can remove the parameter type entirely as well, because it's gotta be a string, and just say name in. But we can go further using special syntax called trailing closure syntax, which looks like this. Remove the opening uh, parens and remove the closing parens too. Just go ahead and launch into a closure straight away after calling filter. Finally, if you want to, Swift can provide for us short parameter names such as $0, $1, $2, and so forth. So we don't even have to write name in. In this case, we can just use $0.has prefix, at which point the whole thing fits on a single line of code. It is quite beautiful. Structs let us make our own custom data types, complete with our own properties and methods. For example, I can make a struct called album. It'll have a title string, it'll have an artist string, and an is released boolean set to true by default. We'll also add a print summary method. This thing will do print uh, title by artist. We can now go ahead and make one. Let red is a new artist, sorry, album, not artist, with a title of red, artist of Taylor Swift, and print red.title and red.print summary, like that. Now when we make one of our custom structs, we're using what's called an initializer. Swift basically lets us treat the thing as if it were a function call, passing in a parameter for each one of the properties we have inside the struct. It actually silently makes this for us, and it's called a memberwise initializer, once each of the member properties it has inside there. Now, if you want to have a struct method change one of its properties, you must mark it as mutating. Mutating func remove from sale is released equals false. A computed property calculates its value every time it's accessed. We can add one here to our employee struct like this. Var vacation remaining is an int and send back vacation allowed minus vacation taken. So we're not having a stored value in there, it's calculated dynamically every time vacation remaining is called. That is now get only, we can't modify that. If you want to modify it, you wanna say this is the getter and below provide a setter, what to do when we try and set this value. In our case, we'll set vacation allowed to be vacation taken plus new value. And new value is provided by Swift and stores whatever value the user was trying to assign to this property. Property observers are pieces of code that runs when a property changes. There are two to choose from. Did set is called after the change has taken place and will set called before the change has taken place. We could demonstrate this by adding a new did set observer to this score property. So whenever it changes, we'll print a new value out. So we'll open a brace then say did set, print score is now score. And when this code runs, it will add and subtract and print out the change as it happens. Initializers are special functions that run when a new instance of a struct is created. It must make sure that all properties inside the struct have a value by the time it finishes. Now Swift will make one of these automatically for your structs, called the memberwise initializer. But sometimes you can make your own to have custom control. For example, I might have one here, init with a name string and no number int. I'll say assign name the parameter to our local property. And for number, I'll pick a random one, but in the range of one through 99. 
Now be careful, when you have reinitializer here, you don't put func before the init. And you never explicitly return a type. It always implicitly returns a type of its struct, in this case, a player. Swift has several options for access control inside structs. There are four that are most common. The first is private, which means let nothing outside the struct read or write this. The second is private set, which means something outside can read it, but only internal things can write it. Then there's file private, which means anything inside the current file can read and write it. And third, there's public, which means let anyone anywhere read or write this. As an example, if we had a struct called bank account, we could have a variable in here, funds equal to zero, with mutating func, deposit some amount integer, and we'll do funds plus equals to amount. Then we might have mutating func, withdraw amount int, returns a bool. And if funds are greater than amount, subtract from funds amount and return true. It all worked. Otherwise, return false. Now, right now, funds is available to everyone to read and write, which means they can bypass our logic in the withdrawal method, making it rather pointless. However, if we modify this to have access control private set, it means we can make a bank account down here. Uh, bank account equals a bank account with funds of 100. And now we can read funds, but we can't write funds. So printing out will work, but uh, adding a thousand to it, whatever, will not work. That will give me a big Swift error when I press play. Swift supports static properties and methods, allowing us to add them directly to a struct type rather than to a particular instance of a struct. For example, I might, might have a struct called app data with a static let version string equal to 1.3 beta 2. Or I might have static let settings file be equal to settings.json. And now everywhere I want to read these values, log files, diagnostics, support emails, about screens, who knows what, I can just do print app data dot version and read that directly rather than making a new app data and trying to read that instance's value. Classes let us create custom data types like structs, but they're different from structs in five key ways. First up, when we make a class, we can make it inherit from or build upon another existing class and it'll gain all the properties and methods of that parent class. For example, I could say there's a class called employee with an hours int property and initializer takes an hours int and copies it into the property like that plus a print summary method which prints uh, I work hours hours a day we can now make a new class called developer based upon employee so it'll gain its property and its methods. In here, I'll add a new method called work, which is say, in a printout, uh, I'm coding for hours, hours a day. We'll then make an instance of developer, let naval equals a developer with hours eight, naval.work and naval.print summary. So we're using methods from the developer class, but also from the parent class, the super class, employee. Now, if a child class like developer wants to change a method it got from the parent class, we must use the override keyword like this. Override func print summary. Inside here, I'll do print, uh, I spend hours, hours a day fighting over tabs versus spaces. That's the first difference. The second difference is that Swift will never make a generated initializer for our classes. This is because initialization for classes is much trickier than structs. And if we boil it right down to the simplified possible rules, really there are just three points. Firstly, as I said, you'll never have a member-wise initializer made for us like we'd have with structs. So you've got to write your own. 
which leads to if you give any child class a custom initializer, it must always call the parent initializer after it's finished configuring its own properties. And third, if a subclass has no custom initializers, it'll automatically inherit all those from its parent. For example, I could say there's a class called vehicle, let is electric be a bull, and then init is electric, bull self is electric equals is electric. We'll then inherit a new class called car from vehicle, and this will have one new property called is convertible, a bull. And the initializer for this has to accept a value for is convertible, but also for vehicles is electric. So I'll say init is electric, bool is convertible, bool. We'll copy that into our local property first, but then critically we've got to call up to the superclass, the parent class, vehicle, telling it its value for is electric. So we'll call super.init is electric is electric. So super let us call up the methods and initializers inside our parent class as needed. The third difference is that all copies of a class share one particular set of data. Meaning if you change one instance, all copies of that instance are also updated. For example, if I had class actor var uh, name equals Nicholas Cage, like this, and then make an instance of actor var actor one equals a new actor, and var actor two, it'll be a copy of actor one. When I change actor 2's name to be Tom Cruise and then print out actor1.name and print actor2.name, you're going to see they are both Tom Cruise. They both point to the same piece of data. This is not the same for struct. Structs never share their data. If I had made this struct actor, then we'd have Nicolas Cage and Tom Cruise printed separately. The fourth difference is that classes can have a deinitializer if they need to, when the last reference to an object is destroyed. This will be run automatically by a system. For example, we could make a class that prints a message when it's created and destroyed. Let's say uh, class site, let id int, init id int, self.id is id and then print out when it's made site id i've been come on <laughs> created and then i'll add a deinitializer afterwards when it's being destroyed and we'll print uh come on hudson site id i've been destroyed like that and what we're saying here is when we're creating one of these things, print a message. When we're deinitializing it, when we're destroying it, print a message. So now let's go ahead and loop from i in one through three. Let site equals a new site with id of i. And then print out uh, site, site.id, I'm in control. Let's go ahead and run that code now. And you'll see that site 1's created, in control, and then destroyed. And then site 2, created, control, destroyed. Site 3, created, control, and destroyed. So it's destroyed as soon as the loop iteration finishes, and a deinitializer is called. The final difference is that classes let us change variable properties, even in the class instance itself is constant. For example, uh, if I want to say there is a uh, class of singer, with a name of Adele, I could say let singer equals singer, and then singer uh, dot name, scroll down slightly, equals Justin, and then print singer dot name. And that will work fine. I can change that even though the instance itself is constant, the property inside it is not. As a result of this, classes don't need to have the mutating keyword in front of methods that change properties. You can always do it. Protocols define functionality we expect other types to support. 
and Swift will ensure they follow the rules correctly. For example, we could define a vehicle protocol like this, protocol vehicle. And I'll say to be a vehicle, you've got to have one method called estimate time for distance int, returning an int. And also another one called travel distance int. That lists the required methods that for this protocol to work. But there's no code inside there. There's no bodies to those functions. We're specifying only the names, parameters, return types, and more. Now, once you have a protocol, you can make other types conform to it by implementing the required functionality. For example, we could make a new struct called car that conforms to the vehicle protocol. And inside there, I'll have estimate time for distance and Swift completes it nicely because it knows we're conforming to the protocol. I'll do distance divided by 50, and then func travel distance. I'll do print I'm driving distance km. Now, all the methods inside the vehicle protocol must exist inside the conforming types with the same name, same parameter types, same return type, and more. You can, of course, add other ones. I could have in here, you know, func open sunroof, print it's a nice day. Because the protocol specifies only the minimum functionality, not the complete functionality. Once we have a protocol in place, we can write a function that accepts any kind of vehicle, car, bike, airplane, whatever. As long as it conforms to vehicle, we know it's safe. Swift knows it implements estimate time for distance and travel distance. So I could say, let's do func commute distance int using vehicle, uh, vehicle, some kind of vehicle. Inside here, we'll say if vehicle dot estimate time for that distance is greater than 100, I'll print too slow. Otherwise, we'll do vehicle dot travel that distance. And I can, even though it accepts any kind of vehicle, I can call it with specific types, like a bike or a car or whatever. I could say let car equals a new car, commute distance 100 using that car. See how it looks? Boom, works correctly. Protocols can also require properties. So we can require properties for how many seats vehicles have and how many passengers they have currently and so forth. Up here, we could say uh, var name will be a string get, oops, get, and var current passengers will be an int that is get and set. So this adds two properties, one called name, which must be a string, and it's marked get, meaning that it might be a constant or a computed property. Current passengers must be an integer, and it's marked get set, read and write. It might be a variable, or a computer property with a getter and a setter. And now all conforming types must add those two properties. I say in here, let name equals car, or var current passengers equals one. Now, if you want to, you can conform to multiple protocols if you need to. Um, just list them out, a comma b comma c comma d up here. And if you want to subclass another class and conform to properties, Put your class name first, then comma, then protocol A, comma B, comma C, comma D. Extensions let us add new functionality to any kind of type. Maybe ones we've made, or maybe Apple's own ones. For example, strings have a method in place to trim white space from the start and end of a string, but it's pretty wordy. So we could use an extension to make it shorter, like this. Extension on string, func trimmed, returns a new string. Inside there, we'll call self dot trimming characters in dot white space in new lines. And now to use it, we'll make a string like this one, var quote equals space, space, space. The truth is rarely pure and never simple, space, space, space. And let trimmed equals quote dot trimmed. Now, if you want to change a value directly inside the method, rather than returning a new value, you want to mark it as mutating. For example, we could do this. Mutating func trim. Don't return a string. It's in place. And inside there, we'll do self equals self dot trimmed. 
So trim ourselves using the previous method and assign it back to ourself. And because quote here is variable, we can say quote dot trim to get it trimmed. Now extensions can also add computed properties to types. For example, we could say on strings again, I want to get the lines inside a string as an array of strings. I could say var lines is an array of strings. And use self dot components separated by dot new lines. Now this method here, components separated by, splits a string into an array of strings based on a boundary of our choosing, which in this case is line breaks. We can now use that with a multi-line string. Let lyrics equals quote, 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 but I keep cruising, can't stop, won't stop moving, quote, quote, quote. And then print out lyrics.lines.count, which should print out two, because it has two lines right now. Protocol extensions let us add computed properties and methods to a whole protocol, so that any type conforming to the protocol get access to them. For example, arrays, dictionaries, and sets all conform to a common protocol called collection. And so we can add a computed property to that so all three of them will get access to it. We'll do extension on collection. Var is not empty is a bool. And it'll send back is empty is equal to false. And now you can put it to use. Let guests equals an array of Mario, Luigi, and peach. And if guests dot is not empty, print guest count is guests dot count. This tiny extension exists in many, many thousands of Swift projects. It's that useful. This approach of extending collections means we can add required methods in the protocol itself. You must add A, B, and C, but then add default implementations of those methods inside a protocol extension and all conforming types for our protocol will get access to our default implementation, or they can override them in their own structs. Optionals represent the absence of data. For example, it's a difference between an integer holding the value of zero and holding nothing at all. For example, in this code here, we've got a string string dictionary with key strings Mario and Luigi. What would happen if I said make peach opposite equal to opposites of peach. Now this attempts to read the value belonging to the key peach, which does not exist. So peach opposite can't be a regular string. It's not there. Swift solution is called optionals and means data that might be there or might not. In this case, peach opposite is an optional string, a string question mark. That's its type, optional string. It might be there or it might have nothing at all, a special value known as nil. Any kind of data can be optional. Optional string, optional int, optional double, optional array, optional bool, they all work, as well as enums, structs, and classes. Now Swift won't let us use optional data directly. It just won't, because it might be empty. That means we've got to look inside the optional, a process called unwrapping the optional. We look inside, See if there's a value. If there is, take it out and use the value somehow. Now Swift gives us various ways of unwrapping optionals because it's very common. But the one you'll see most looks like this. If let Mario opposite equals opposites of Mario, then print Mario's opposite is Mario opposite, like that. So this thing here is gonna read the optional value from our dictionary. And if it has a string inside, which it does, it'll be taken out of the optional and placed into Mario opposite. And it's not optional anymore. And this constant is available inside the braces right here as a non-optional string, and we can use it with the print call. Swift has a second way of unwrapping optionals called guardlet. This is very similar to iflet, but it flips things around. Whereas iflet runs a code between its braces if the optional has a value, i.e. it's not nil. Guardlet does the opposite. It runs a code between its braces if the optional does not have a value. 
here's how it looks. I make a new function called print square of number and optional int. It could be a million or zero, minus a million or nil, nothing at all. Now we can only square numbers that have actual values. So the first thing we'll do is check there's a real number in there. We'll unwrap it using guard let. Guard let number equals number, else print missing input and return. If we're here, we can now use number as a non-optional integer. So I'll do print number x number is number star number, like that. Now, if you use guard in this way to check a function's inputs are valid, then Swift requires you to exit the function if your test fails. And so if number was empty, I have to have return here. If I don't have return here, Swift will complain very loudly indeed. No, you can't do that. You must exit the current scope, which right now is the function. However, if the optional did have a value inside, like we have here, it's available after the guard finishes. That's why I can refer to number in all these places as a non-optional integer. Here's a tip for you, guard works with any condition, including ones that don't unwrap optionals. For example, guard some array dot is empty, else return. Believe it or not, Swift has a third way of unwrapping optionals called the nil coalescing operator. It'll unwrap the optional, but if it's empty, it'll let you provide a default value instead. Here's how it looks. Let TV shows equals an array of Archer, Babylon 5, and Ted Lasso. Now, if we read a random element from that using the random element method of arrays, we'll get back an optional string because the array could have been empty. So we'll say let favorite equals TV shows dot random element. But I don't want a random element. I always want a real string back. So I'll use a nil coalescing operator, question mark, question mark, with none, so we always get a real string back. Now this operator is really useful in all the places where optionals appear. For example, making an integer from a string returns an optional integer, because you might have provided fish rather than five, an invalid number. Here we can use nil coalescing to provide a sensible default integer. For example, let input equals an empty string, not a valid number. Let number equals an int of that input, nil coalescing zero, and now print out number. And because that test will fail, this is not a valid integer, it'll be set to zero, our default value, and print out down at the bottom. Optional chaining reads optionals inside optionals like this. Let names equals an array of Aya, Bran, Rob, and Sansa. Then let chosen equals names dot random element question mark dot uppercase. And now print out next in line is either chosen, nil coalescing, or no one. Like that. Now when that code runs, it'll pick a random name. In this case it's pricked Arya, name one of my dogs. <laughs> um, but if it went wrong, it'd print no one. But notice how it's uppercased. That is nil coalescing in action. It's right here on line four. This question mark followed by more code. It allows to say, if the optional has a value inside, then whatever, some more code. In our case, we're saying, if random element returned a valid string, then uppercase it. When calling a function that might throw errors, we can use an optional try, try question mark, to convert any errors into optional nil, and any success into an optional with the value inside. Here's how it looks. First up, as usual, make a new error type, I'll have a user error, that conforms to Swift's error protocol. I'll then say there are two errors, bad ID, and network failed. We'll then make a function that throws errors. So I'll say get user with an ID int, can throw errors, returns a string. And we'll immediately, just for testing purposes, throw user error dot network failed. 
And now we want to call get user. But we don't care what comes back. We just care, did it work or did it not work? We can do that by saying, if let user equals try question mark, get user ID 23, print user is user. And so the get user function will always throw an error. In this case, network failed. But we don't actually care what was thrown. All we care was, did we get a user back or not? If you want to know exactly which error came back, you can't use try question mark. You gotta use do, try and catch instead. We've covered the majority of Swift language fundamentals in this one very, very fast video but we've only scratched the surface of what Swift can do. If you want to carry on learning, there's stacks more of Swift language features to learn, but I'd recommend against it just yet, despite I'm sure there being commenters lining up below to ask why I didn't mention their favorite Swift language feature. And I'm saying to stop for a reason. You know enough now to go and build real apps, good apps with Swift and SwiftUI. Learn and practice what you have right now. And then if you want to, come back and learn some more and more and more and more. But first, put into practice what you have. And if you want, you can follow my free 100 Days of Swift UI course. It's all on YouTube or on my site with tests and more. It walks you through building fantastic iOS apps from scratch with the skills covered in this video. And if you like this video, please press like or subscribe to the channel even better. And yes, if you want to tell me why did I miss off enum, associated values, whatever, go ahead and mention that in the comments below and I'll, I'll try and read them. Take care, folks. Well done for making it through this very long, very fast and quite hard video in places. Your reward is a chance to see my dog, Aria. This is one of the two Sammy heads I have. Uh, she can have some treats because she's been a very good girl and let me record this full hour of Swift stuff without interruption. Here you go, one for you. Uh, she loves to come in while I'm recording and woo or bark or just stare at me silently until she gets some treats. And fortunately she gave me a whole hour of difficult recording without interrupting too much. So she's been a very, very good girl and she can have some treats. I do have two Sammy Yeds. The other one, Luna, isn't quite so smart. This one listens to me talking in a closed room and knows, aha, it's recording time, that means I can get some treats. Oh, the other one's just arrived. <laughs> the other one heard, and it's coming now. The other one's obviously getting smart over time. There you go, Aria, you eat that one. Good girl. And Luna, come on, you can get a treat too. Let everyone see you, come on, up here. There we go, other dog, have a treat too. They are good dogs, really.